Hello, everybody. Uh, this is the intro video for Lab 4, Diffraction and Interference. In this lab, we will talk about diffraction and interference. Um, so really quickly, so that you know what some of these d's and theta mean, uh, this is kind of the progression that you'll go through in lecture as well. So first, you'll be introduced to the ideal double slit. And these ideal double slits are infinitely small. Like, they let calculus epsilon teeny tiny, the tiniest number that is possibly imaginable of light through these infinitely small slits. And as you write out the geometry, what you realize is that at some point on this screen, which is located some distance away, uh, this light ray has traveled farther than this light ray. And for instance, if this light ray has traveled a full wavelength more than that light ray, they show up at the same phase. So each one of them is at their crest together or their trough together. However, if this light ray has traveled half a wavelength farther than that one, they'll arrive and make destructive interference. So the full details of the derivation hopefully should be gone over in lab, but basically this little piece of extra length traveled d sine theta will tell you if you get destructive or constructive interference based on how many multiples of the wavelength it is. So d sine theta equals n lambda is the fundamental equation that describes double slit interference. So light from this travels farther than light from that or the other way around. n is an integer constructive, n is half integer, positive or negative, I get destructive. So what that means in you know, an actual experiment, if I have a double slit, what I should see is halfway in between, they travel the same length, I should get constructive, so I should have some high intensity, and then I should get this travels half a wavelength, this one travels half a wavelength longer than that ray, so they get destructive, constructive, destructive. And in an idealized version, I would see an inner intensity pattern that looks like this, alternating bright and dark fringes, bright, dark, bright, dark. So turns out that you're not going to see that. Um, and to understand what you actually see in an actual double slit, not an ideal one, you need to talk about the phenomenon of diffraction. So diffraction occurs when I have a slit that has some non-zero width. So diffraction in some sense is also an interference phenomenon where light through the slit is interfering with light through the slit. And again, the details of the derivation will be done over in lecture, but basically the light from the top of the slit is interfering with light from the middle of the slit and light from the bottom of the slit. There's a really clever way of pairing them off, but what you get is that uh, a really kind of annoyingly similar looking relationship will tell you where the dark spots are. So d sine theta, where d is the width of the slit itself, the width of the slit, d sine theta, is equal to m lambda, and if m is an integer, what I get is destructive interference. So m is an integer, and technically uh, what should be true is m is a non-zero integer. So I'll go over at least one aspect of the pairing argument so you see why you get this bright central fringe. So if I have the point right directly across from my non-zero actual single slit, what I could do is I could pair off the individual light rays, or what you might call wavelets if you're thinking about the wave picture. Um, the one right below it with the right, one right above it, they travel the same length, they constructively interfere. The one all the way at the top of the slit will constructively interfere with the one all the way at the bottom and pair them off like that. So one way or another, what you get is a bright spot, bright central fringe. And then this condition, d sine theta equals m lambda, will tell you where these first and second order minima are. Okay. So for a single slit, you actually get a pattern that looks like this, alternating bright and dark fringes with a big, bright central fringe that's twice as wide as these. Okay, so what happens when we look at, because you know, we don't have access to infinitely thin things, what happens if you look at an actual double slit, and these things have, I did not come up with this notation, blame your textbook, uh, slit width of D, capital D, and slit distance, distance from slit to slit of little d. So the good news is, is I can just use this to modify that pattern, and what'll happen is I'll get diffraction because the slits are of non-zero size, and then I'll also get two-slit interference. So my overall pattern will actually have both of these features. And I'll get rid of these rays too. So I'll have a diffraction pattern, 
And then inside of that diffraction pattern, I'll get individual interference peaks. So big beads and little beads. The little chunky beads are the interference peaks, and then the large overall waviness of that indicates the diffraction pattern. So again, details and derivations of these will happen in lecture, but what I want to do is show you guys. Hey, welcome back. We uh, some minor editing going on here, um, but we're trying. We're trying. Uh, this is only try to believe it or not on getting this stuff to show up on screen. Uh, we'll see how many more this takes. So anyway, we've got a little laser. Uh, we've got a couple of little wheels of various types of slits. So we'll look at diffraction interference just on a kind of small scale here. Um, this one, I've got a couple different options that I can select for um, double slit settings. Um, and this one, I've got some single slit settings. So you can look at diffraction with different slit width. Um, and then there's some other cool little comparisons that we can look at in here as well. Um, but let's get straight to the science because that's the exciting part. So we've got double slits real close together. Um, so you can see real close together slits. You've got a real broad pattern. Um, and right to just to the left of the big bright spot, you see a little dark spot and that little bright spot scan. What's, what's that all about, Doug? So this feature this big kind of larger bead made up of smaller beads, this would be the central diffraction maxima. This would be the first diffraction minima, second diffraction minima, third diffraction, wait, how do I count? First diffraction minima, second diffraction minima, third diffraction minima, and actually you can even see the fourth out there. And each of these individual beads would be the interference maxima and minima. So this is the little d sine theta, and these would be the big d sine theta. And I can zoom in and you can see the individual beating from the interference pattern. So this would be a real double slit where you have to worry about both diffraction and interference. Cool. So now let's see what happens if we move those slits away from each other a little bit. If we increase the distance between them. So then by changing the little d, what I've changed is the interference pattern. You can see much more beating, even though the diffraction minima are basically in the same spot. So changing little d, the slit spacing, spacing in between the two slits, has changed the number of interference peaks by quite a lot. So I guess that was quite a change. But we've still got the same slit width, like each of the width, slits themselves are the same width, which you can tell by the, uh, the diffraction minima are still at the same locations. Now what if we have a double slit where you know, it's going to be like this double slit that we had before. We're going to have the same spacing, but we're going to make a different width of our, use a different width for our slit itself. So we'll see the same width of the interference peaks, but the diffraction peaks are at a very different length there because our spots, our slit is a lot thicker this time. So we've got a thinner diffraction pattern. So each one of the beads is the same size, but then the location of the first diffraction minima, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. I don't know if you guys can see that, but I can pretend to see a ninth. Holy crap. Um, so by changing the slit sizes, I can change the location of the diffraction minima locations. Here's one more just because it's there. Why not? Yeah. All right. Let's look at some single slits too. Let's just take a single slit by itself. I've got a nice... Get over into place. Okay, so this is a really, really, really thin slit. So this is diffraction only. And the thinner the slit, the wider space the interference pattern. So this would be what we kind of cartoonified on the chalkboard as that. So this interference pattern. So that's the intensity pattern that we're illustrating there. So now we're just going to quickly sweep through some, oh, okay. Not terribly quickly, but we're going to just sweep through some thicker and thicker slit sizes. So that's a wider single slit. You can see the diffraction patterns are getting closer and closer. Even wider single slit. So that's a single slit that's actually pretty narrow. Pretty wide. <laughs> Sorry, pretty wide. <laughs> really, it's a big boy. <laughs> I mean, it's pretty narrow, but it's pretty wide compared to the last ones. <laughs> Cool. So what if we were to compare the single slit and the double slit right by side by side? Wow, that would be really great. If only the what is it, the Pasco Scientific Corporation 
made such a device. Holy crap, look at that. Look at that size. So side by side, what you have on the left side is an actual double slit where each of the slits has some appreciable width. So you see the interference pattern, so the little beads, and then the diffraction pattern. And then to the right on this side, <laughs> my hands in the way, <laughs> to the right on this side, this is the diffraction pattern. So you see the diffraction peak, diffraction minima, diffraction central diffraction peak, first diffraction minima, and only one slit. One slit of some width, and then two slits of the same width on the left-hand side. And that's what shows up in an actual double-slit experiment, not the idealized one that you guys first saw. Want to see some two-dimensional things? Two-dimensional patterns? Why not? We got the thing here, don't we? Let's look at if you have a square array of just holes. So this would be a square pattern of holes with a laser shining on it? Yep. And what about a hexagonal one that put oh. a hex on you? We have to club, yo. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's, do you want to talk about laser speckle at all? I don't want to talk about laser speckle, cool. except that it's that. really important. Yeah. <laughs> so that was just a <laughs> slit plate with a bunch of holes in it. What about a teeny little aperture? You know, the teeny little circular aperture brings up kind of an interesting question. If, for instance, I had a light impinging on a circular object, what would I see on the far side? Just a circular shadow? Probably, but that would be the best thing for the next video edit that we add in. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so circular aperture, and then you can see some diffraction rings if this thing auto-focuses properly. The science is working, the technology is not. <laughs> so focus there we on go. The science. So you can see the rings. So this would just be a circular hole. I pause that and... Yo, so let's do the uh, that last edit that we that I alluded to. So on this one, we are going to look at a uh, just a bead in the way of our laser beam. It's going to be a completely inverted case of the last thing that we just looked at. Last case, we just had you know that sort of shape, but a hole instead of an object. So we've got a big round circular object that's going to block the light. Um, I'll fire up the laser and um, it'll just shine onto our bead and just create a nice little shadow that we'll look at. Um, so what we're looking at is the, uh, what, well, let's back up a second, talk about the, the foolish theorist who uh, was shown up by the experimentalist. Easy there. <laughs> <laughs> so, a very brilliant mathematician by the name That's of better. Semyon Poisson. <laughs> um, he um, thought that the wave theory of light was a pretty pre preposterous proposition because that would mean that um, if the wave theory of light were correct, light that is traveling around a bead like this um, you know, according to the diffraction that we've been looking at so far, light coming around, all these different sides of it would converge and um, you'd have a point behind it where all the light that's bending around it would um, converge at the same point. You'd have the same path length all the, way, all the way to that point, right in the very center of that shadow. And that doesn't make any sense because it means that you'd have a really, really bright spot in the center of your shadow, which is absolutely nonsense. Um, so, a, another scientist, an experimentalist this time, um, by the name of either Arago or Arago, meh, something, something Lord of the Ringsy. Um, he performed the measurement and took a, um, basically set up similar to this, just without as high power of a laser. Um, and we will try and recreate his experiment in a little bit higher tech. Um, and let's see if it works. Let's see if we can see anything up here. So this is kind of what I would expect. I see the shadow of a laser with a circle-y thing on it. But then what happens if I really get closer and zoom in? So for one thing, I see this really neat kind of like uh, 
scallopy wavy stuff. So those are diffraction patterns, right? And then if I really, really, really zoom in, what I see right there, so I'm gonna off, on, off, on, yeah, right there. Really yep, so I see a bright spot. And the bright spot again is caused by all of the individual wavelengths, wavelets of light going around the edge of this, spreading out, and because they all have the same path length to the center of the circle, they all constructively interfere and make this bright spot in the center of the dark shadow. So the kind of nutshell argument was this uh, mathematician said, you guys are crazy. If wave was a light, you'd see a bright spot in the center of a circular shadow. And then somebody actually did it and said, yeah, I, I actually see a bright spot in the center of that circular shadow. And so he named it after him to shame him for all eternity. He'll never live it down. For the rest of existence, it'll be known as the Poisson spot, <laughs> endurance of his folly. <laughs>